Welcome. My name is Sarah and I'm a volunteer with AERP NC Mountain Region. AERP's mission is to empower people to choose how they live as they age and according to a recent survey, three out of four older Americans want to stay in their homes and age in place. And research indicates that pets can help us enjoy life, reduce our stress, provide a sense of purpose, help us stick to a routine, and animals can help build a social network needed to age in the community. This virtual series focuses on animal-human bond and how our relationship with animals can reinforce good health while strengthening and expanding our social networks. You have joined the third part of our series focusing on animal-human relationships. During the presentation today, we invite you to comment and ask questions in the comment section on Facebook. The comment section on Facebook is generally below the video. And we'll do our best to answer your questions and respond to your comments. Today, our topic of discussion is ways respectful training can enhance our ability to age in place with dogs. We'll be talking with Melissa Helms, a graduate of Animal Behavior College, where she earned her certification as an ABC certified dog trainer. She'll help us understand how we can communicate with our dogs to maximize the human animal relationship, as well as how to help our dogs help us. Melissa is an Appalachian State University graduate. She admits to really loving to be around all types of animals and currently has, wait for it, 16 dogs and a cat, <laughs> each having their very own unique personality. Melissa has lots of credentials and here are a few. Animal Behavior College dog trainer and mentor trainer, AKC citizen, AKC Good Citizen Evaluator, Alliance for Therapy Dogs Tester and Observer, Association of Pet Dog Trainers Professional Member, Canine Life and Social Skills Instructor and Evaluator, and the Family Dog Private Trainer. She's also my dog trainer and recently worked with Mocha, our one and a half year old Aussie mix, and Max, our mix of mixes probably has some terrier. He just turned one. So now the reason you came, we have Melissa with us. And um, I'm going to start with the first question that she's going to help address. Um, welcome, Melissa. What are the most important and useful skills to teach and reinforce? I would say for any pet owner, any dog owner, um, the most useful skill that I always start with is a watch me cue. And that basically means stop what you're doing and look at me. Um, no matter what situation you're in, what environment you're in, it's really important to be able to get your dog's attention on you. Um, if you have a dog that doesn't recall well, they won't recall if they're not going to turn around and give you attention and at least acknowledge what you're asking of them. So that's the one I would definitely start with. It's a very easy cue to teach, and I teach that before I teach anything else so that we've got a really good base to start from. Um, after that, good leash walking is really, really important. Everybody would like to have a dog that walks well and walks nicely on a leash. It's very important to have a dog not pull you, um, you know, not lunge at other dogs if possible, not lunge at people, just walk nicely by your side. It's a much more enjoyable experience for the owner and for the dog if you have a dog that walks nicely on the leash. Uh, I touched on it a minute ago, but great recall is very important. Um, that's your come command. So it's really, really helpful to have a dog that comes when you call them. That's a very important skill. It's a life-saving skill a lot of times because if a dog gets away and they get in the road, you want to make sure that they'll come back when you call them. Um, very important for that one. The Another one that I use quite often is the wait cue, which is basically stopping in a temporary state going in and out of doors or getting in and out of the car, different things like that. The wait cue is very important because you don't want a dog that will bolt 
out of a door if you have it and leave it open or if you have guests coming in or you're bringing in groceries, that sort of thing. And same thing with the way in and out of vehicles. If you take your dog to the park often and they love going to the park, but they're a little bit too exuberant, then a weight cue is very helpful to keep them remaining in the car until you can get the leash safely on them. Um, and we do have a, uh, another one, which is a leave it cue. The leave it cue is a cue that's helpful for your dogs not to put things in their mouths that they really shouldn't have in their mouths. So the best example I can think of with that is if you drop a bottle of Advil on the floor and it goes everywhere, a leave it cue is very helpful to be able to say leave it and your dog doesn't swallow those medications and that sort of thing. So those are really the, the, the top five, in my opinion, that are really important to have as good skills for your dog. And I think we have a video of the weight cue. Wait. Wait. Sit. Okay. So that's my dog, Rogue, and we were working on the weight cue. That's our training center. So I had opened the gate to start to take him home, and he got overly excited. So I thought it would be a good example to put the weight cue in there to kind of show you how that can be beneficial so he's not running out of doors and running out of gates without my permission to do so. Great. Okay, Th this is a question that I have asked you and I will ask you publicly now. Okay. Uh, how, do you, how do you help your dog unlearn? How do you not reinforce an undesirable behavior? Okay, so um, a good example of that is a dog jumping on people. I'll use that as an example. So what I do with dogs jumping on people, a lot of people get caught up in the no, down, stop, off, and they're flailing their hands and that sort of thing. That's very reinforcing to a dog because what they want is attention and that's exactly what they're getting, you know, in that instance. So what I do is um, train an incompatible, desirable behavior. So the sit for greeting is where that comes in, and we've done it tons of times in class. But if, um, if you come home from work and your dog is jumping on you, then I would cue a sit so that your dog puts their bottom on the ground and you give them affection when their bottom is on the ground. The same thing would work if you have your dog um, on leash out at the park and people come up and want to ask, you know, may I pet your dog? Yes, you can pet them, but they need to sit first because we're working on jumping. So their default behavior should go to a sit to earn the reward of the petting by the distraction or by you or whoever it might be. So that's a good one for sure. Another good one, I think, would be treat, teaching the watch me, which I touched on a minute ago, if you do have a dog that's a little bit leash reactive. So say you're walking your dog and they walk nicely for the most part, but if they see another dog, they get very, very excited. They want to go over. They want to play, as most dogs do. If you can teach the watch me and get your dog's eyes back on you, it gives them an incompatible, desirable behavior because they're wanting to give you attention instead of going to visit, you know, the other people and that sort of thing. So that's a really, really, really good one. Um, another one that I can think of is if you have a dog that is over exuberant about food, I would teach a sit and a stay in that instance. So if I am making a dog's meal and they're jumping and jumping and jumping because they want the food out of the bowl, what I would teach is a sit and a stay and make them kind of use some impulse control and stay in that seated position until I can set the bowl down in front of them. So it's a lot safer experience for everybody and it teaches them very good manners for sure. Okay. Um, I thought we had a question, but I don't see it. Um, let's see. Oh, someone made a comment. I also use ignore for when other dogs bark at us and agitate him. Mm -hmm. so the command is ignore. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's a good cue. And that's basically just exactly what the, the user is saying to ignore that experience. I would probably also you can leave, leave, use leave it in that, you know, in that situation as well. Um, just saying don't go any further towards that distraction that's, you know, coming into play here. So, but yeah. Right. Ignore is 
And so commands don't have to be the exact same words you use. No, um, no. Like you, you say, watch me and I'll say, look, yeah. mm -hmm. Max, look, and that's his watch me. Yep. So, yeah. The cues really, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of one word sharp cues. So I'll say, watch, watch me, that sort of thing. Things that I don't say often in conversation with other people, but as far as the individual users and their dogs, you know, it's whatever works best for the, the owner and the handler and the dog. So, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So we've talked during the series a lot about benefits of having dogs and importance of, you know, the relationship to the dog, but mm -hmm. I know you've got some particular things you wanted to point out. So uh, do you mind sharing those with us? Absolutely. So there's all kinds of benefits to having a dog. And then there are benefits to having the dog that you can further into the training spectrum. So I'll just talk about the regular benefits first. Um, companionship is a huge one. Having somebody, you know, with you and um, being able to care for them. There's a big sense of responsibility and an investment when you have a pet. It's a, you know, it's a big responsibility to be responsible for another being's life. So you want to make sure you do a good job to take care of them. And that can really help, you know, motivate you to get out and do different things. Um, exercise is a huge one as well. And we have so many options in the training world um, where you can do exercise classes with your dogs in different ways. And you can do dog sports that you think may not be um, an option. For example, um, many of my clients do nose work with their dogs, and that's a very low impact sport, but it's something that is very, very fun. So basically you teach the dog to search out a specific scent. So you can use um, cardboard boxes around your house. You can use uh, different cones, different things that you can put the scent in. And you can take a class for that. You can actually compete in that with AKC trials in different places. Um, you can also just do it for fun, you know, in your living room. There are other sports that you can do with your dogs. Um, one of the ones that my clients like a lot is agility. And, um, you know, it's, I guess, younger dogs tend to do better in it, but definitely it's a good way to keep um, older owners and older dogs very fit because there's a lot of movement and you can do low impact agility as well. So I think we do have a video of one of my clients. Good. And then twist your body quick, pick her up with your left. There you go. Good. Good. Pick her up with your right. She can go across. That's okay. So T is, in, he, she was 11 years old at the time. She's a rescue that I've worked with for many, many years. And T used to be a fairly reactive dog, but we have done so much work with her um, around other dogs that she actually has also gotten her canine good citizen. And she did our hound around town class, which uh, we take everybody out to the restaurants and hang out and work on manners as far as uh, extended downstays and settles and just being calm in an environment like that. So that's tell, one us that's what react, tell us what reactive is, because not everybody may understand that. Okay. So a reactive dog can be reactive um, to any number of things. Usually it's going to be to other dogs. It's most likely that a dog will be dog reactive. And what that means is the dog is, and it's usually a leash thing. Sometimes it's otherwise, but usually if a dog is on leash, they feel that opposition reflex and they feel a little bit trapped. So they might have had a negative experience with other dogs approaching them when they were younger at some point in their past. They might have had a traumatic history. So a reactive dog just means that those are the dogs that you're likely to see that when they're on leash with their owner and they see another dog, they're likely to bark and lunge and jump towards that dog, mainly because they're fearful. So, yeah. And so that was a senior handler and a senior dog. It was. Mm -hmm. Right. Awesome. Yes, they do a great job. Let's see. Some other things that 
um, we can talk about for sure are different stress levels as far as the dogs helping out the owners. There are many, many studies that say that uh, stress levels as far as cortisol in both the dogs and the owners are lower when you have pets and you're a senior. So it's a really big deal as far as petting dogs in general lower, lowers the cortisol levels. So that effect really multiplies when it's your own pet and you've got that, you know, kind of comfort there all the time. So I think there was a question. I can definitely answer them whenever you guys are ready. Let's see, any tips for extreme leash reactivity with an older adopted dog? How do you get that to watch me? So um, the older adopted part, it can be a little bit difficult just because there may be some physical limitations there. But if there's not and you're trying to train a watch me, the first thing you would want to do is get a treat put it in front of the dog's nose and bring the treat up to your nose. And you're going to do this off leash. This is not something that you're going to start introducing when the dog is having a reactive moment. You want to practice this a whole lot before that. So you definitely want to take the treat and take your treat in front of your dog's nose, draw it up to your nose and say, watch me. You do that over and over and over until the dog is pretty comfortable with it. And then after that, you want to start working with it outside. So you definitely want to take it outside and work with your dog on leash, practice that in that environment. Clicker training is really helpful for this. So if your dog responds well to the clicker, you can always use that. That's a positive reinforcement tool if you're not familiar with clicker training. Um, I would use high, high value rewards. So little pieces of cheese or little pieces of hot dogs, something like that. And one thing that usually helps reactive dogs is if your dog is really prone to pulling and you've got on a harness that clips in the back or you're just using a regular collar, I would really think about um, a front clip harness because that can lessen the opposition reflex. It helps with pulling and it helps them not so feel so confined in that moment. So hope, hopefully that answers the first question. Is there another question? Two dogs that are great separately. They feed off each other's energy, react with the squirrels. Um, it really depends as far as the dogs. Um, if you're not trying the front clip harnesses, I would. So um, for the reactive level of the two dogs, if that's something that you haven't tried yet, you would need to try that for sure. You can train a watch me when you have two dogs. It's a little bit difficult. One thing I might try as an alternative would just be, um, would be, having maybe some anti-anxiety aids for the walk. So having your dog wear possibly a thunder shirt if it's not too hot or trying some Adaptil, which is the pheromones that are calming. You can try lavender essential oil. There's all kinds of things that you can try that are not something that the dog has to take internally. CBD, a lot of people use. Um, if I was gonna have that, my go-to would probably be pheromones that I spray on a bandana that I put around their neck for the walk. That would be my first thing to kind of take that, you know, reactive level. Cause usually there's a bit of anxiety there too that you can bring down with that. So, yeah. I tried a firm no bark command when my Yorkie barks at the door. Oh, so. The no bark is interesting. <laughs> I'm not a trainer. A lot of trainers will say uh, to teach your dog to bark so that then you can cue a no bark. I'm pretty, um, pretty familiar with dogs that just bark on their own. And it sounds like the Yorkie started that as well. For the no bark cue, what I would probably do is to redirect with the watch me and give them an alternative behavior to do. So I would redirect with the watch me because I think the first thing would be to get the Yorkie away from the window and to stop looking at whatever is, you know, increasing the need to bark and uh, do some other activities. So if that were happening at my house, I would do a watch me and I would probably uh, deviate to maybe like an activity if there's a, a time of the day when the barking is going to be more prolific to maybe have a snuffle mat, which is like a little uh, mat that has little fleece pieces. You can hide their kibble in that. Just give them something else to do. And a lot of people would say, well, isn't that rewarding the barking? Not necessarily if you put something in between. So you're, you're really asking for the watch me, you're redirecting them and you're giving them an alternative, um, you know, distraction to kind of keep them busy. But definitely not allowing access to what they're barking at can help you as well. So, other questions? Oh, hi! Hi, 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 Judith. That's awesome. I'm so excited. 
Did you get to see T's video? I hope she did. That's great. Okay, I think, I think we're back to the benefits. You, I'm not even sure where you were, but... Um. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. One of the benefits, I mean, you can say that protection is a benefit as well. I don't know how valid that would be, but I can tell you that, you know, if you're worried about um, people breaking in or something like that, a dog that barks and alerts you, it's it's a signal that you may not have had otherwise, you know, and that can be something as simple. I have a four pound Pomeranian that if somebody walks in, it's yap, 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 you know, and she's pretty good about telling me and then stopping the barking. You don't have to have a huge dog to have that benefit. Just a sound to alert you that there's something new happening is is very helpful for sure. So um, let's see, getting out, you know, if you have dogs that you want to get out in the world and interact with, that's a great thing. A lot of my clients, um, because they have the time, they're retirees. If you have a dog that's suitable for therapy work, that's a really great way to give of your time and to work with training with your dog. So I do um, certifications for Alliance of Therapy Dogs. And we have several, I was previously with Therapy Pets Unlimited, now with Alliance, but we have um, about 30 therapy dogs in the high country area that I have certified that go into the universities, the hospitals, cancer center, um, the assisted living communities, uh, all kinds of places. I have five therapy dogs and we typically um, go to the elementary schools. I have a dog that's in a reading program. So not all ha not all dogs have the temperament for therapy work. Like I said, out of my 16, I have five that are therapy dogs. The rest won't be. They're very much sport dogs. They want to work. They don't enjoy being petted by other people. So their avenue is not, you know, not therapy work, but it's a really great way to give of your time to keep your dog busy and to utilize that skill. If you're dog is cut out for that as well. Let's see, what else can I think of? Other than that, you know, your dogs, just getting them out and going to different functions with them, if that's something that you're, you're able to do. Um, there are all kinds of different activities that you can participate in. There are hiking clubs, a lot of places that are just for people with dogs. So you can meet up, take your dogs on a hike if that's something that you love to do. We do, um, we stopped it during COVID, but we'll get back to it this summer, a walking club that I do at the Greenway. So it's a lot of dog owners that they don't necessarily want to sign up for a formal class. It's like a drop-in thing where you show up with with your dog. We do a short leash walking session. We do some sit for greeting sessions so that they can be accustomed to meeting other people coming up and asking for that attention and reinforcing the good behavior with the sit for greeting. So all kinds of ways you can get involved with stuff out there. So, yep. Okay. Um, one more question from me. Um, I'm really interested in teaching specific skills to assist me or assist others. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me like what can you teach a dog or can you give me some examples of sure. yeah. how so, a dog can assist? Yeah, absolutely. So this kind of falls in the realm of service dog training, but there are a lot of things that you can teach an individual dog to do that really you don't have to have them service. They don't need service credentials. Service dogs are dogs that assist with specific tasks that you need, but they're also probably going to be going, you know, on airplanes and different things. They're traveling a lot. You don't have to go that far with it. You can teach your dog to assist you around your house with various tasks. Um, there's so many things that you can get help with. One of my clients, um, Zephyr, and his mom, Nikki, he is a service dog in training. So she's working with him on um, different things. Like if she falls, she's going to ask him to come support her. He's a black lab. So he's got plenty, you know, enough weight on him. And he's good for a brace cue. As far as if she falls, she can grab with his harness and pull herself up. Um, another thing that they work on is she has a hard time with vertigo. So he is learning to pick up his food bowl and give it to her so that it's one last time that she has to bend over. So he retrieves his food bowl for her. And I I think we've got a couple of those videos. If you guys want to show them, I can explain each one after a little bit more detail. So,
Yeah. So that's the brace video. That's Zephyr and Nikki. And we've been working on that um, for, I guess, a couple months now. And it's really beneficial for her because Zephyr does do a lot of off leash playing. So the first part of that is getting him obviously to come to her if she falls. So his recall is very, very solid. He comes every time that she requests that he comes and she just gives him the cue brace and he comes right in front, sits down and she's able to grab on and pull herself up. So that's a, that's a very beneficial one. The key to that though, is you'd have to have a dog who is physically able to support the weight. So that's one of the tasks that only a bigger dog can do. So, yes. And then the next one I think was the food bowl. Oh, we can talk about this one too. <laughs> so this one is a touch cue, I believe. And I'll let the... So what we're talking about here is Rogue is learning a touch command, which is a hand target. And um, he's got this. Yep, I've got this sticky note on the hand target. So he first starts targeting my hand. Then I take the sticky note and Rogue gives the sticky note a target with his nose. So you'll see me offer that and he gives nose pressure to the sticky note. And we do that over and over and over until that's a very strong and solid skill where he offers the nose pressure. And then the next part, I believe he's going to target it on the ground, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, so it looks like I put the sticky note down for him. He's just wandering. So I think I'm doing some talking in this video clip and I'm about to put the sticky note on the ground. Yep, so there's a sticky note on the ground. And then Rogue knows a nose target and a paw target. So he can close things with both his nose and his paws, depending on what we're working with. Um, sometimes it's easier for him to use his paws. Sometimes it's easier for him to use his nose. So I'm giving the touch cue and I'm trying to reinforce in this video just the nose. So you'll see me not reward if he puts his paw on it, but I do reward when he touches it with his nose. And then you can take that sort of skill, a touch cue, and transfer it to cabinets, doors, that sort of thing. And what you do is take the sticky note, if that's what you're using, place it on the object that you want them to close. And I think we're going to show that in just a second, where we take the, the sticky note, we put it on the door, he targets it. So he starts learning to put more and more pressure as we go along. And he's going to go over to the bathroom door, yeah, in our training center. And you see we've got a sticky note there. And he gets very excited about this. So I teach him to close the door and he realizes with the nose it's not going to work. So he finishes it up and closes it with his paw. So that works pretty well with that one. <laughs> yeah. Were you guys able to hear me as I explained throughout the video? Okay, great. Great. And the other one was and the bowl. Then, Do we still have the video? Of, uh... Go get it. Get it. Thank you. Sit. Good boy. So that's Zephyr, and that's the same dog you saw in the video a few minutes ago. Um, Nikki wasn't here. He was boarding with me when I was teaching him that skill. But we just worked with retrieval. So basically with him, I'd start with the food bowl, and I would cue a take it where he knows he's supposed to put the food bowl in his mouth. And then after he's comfortable with that, we had to kind of – figure it out though because Zeph needs to eat from a slow eater bowl and it's hard with the ridges in a slow eater bowl for him to get his mouth around it because of the way the food bowl is shaped. So keep that in mind too if your dog eats from a slow eater that's going to be a little bit of a harder cue you know to to teach them because of the way the bowl kind of fits in their mouth it's a little bit more difficult but we taught him that so that he can go pick up his own food bowl and bring it back and give it to Nikki and then she doesn't have to bend over for that. So yeah, I'm happy to take another question if there is one. Sure. Do you know of a trainer in this area for therapy work? 
Oh, I do not know offhand about um, a therapy dog trainer in the Brevard area. What I would probably suggest is you can go to one of the therapy dog organizations. So, if, for example, if you go, um, I think Alliance of Therapy Dogs, it's therapydogs.com, if I believe correctly. You can go to whatever therapy dog organizations have tester observers in that areas. And most likely, you'll have a list of uh, people that you can get in with. They can probably give you a suggestion if they aren't trainers themselves, and most of them will be. They can give you some suggestions of where you can find good positive reinforcement trainers that can do the therapy dog testing and evaluations before you actually take the test. Because definitely some basic obedience is very important when you're doing therapy dog testing just to make sure the dog is under control. So, yeah, that would be my my advice, though. And I think it is therapydogs.com, if I remember correctly. Okay, do we have any more questions? Because oh, we do. Let's see. Okay. So tips for a dog with separation anxiety. It really depends on how severe the separation anxiety is and what the environment looks like um, when you do have to leave them. And what I mean by that is basically, is it a crate issue if you're crate training or is it something that it's just separation in general? So if you're using a crate and you want to use a crate, they're a very good tool if they're introduced properly. That can be something that you can introduce as a positive place and it can be kind of like their den. So if you're using a crate, I would say you can cover the crate to make it a little bit darker and so they can't see out of it. General rules though for separation anxiety, again, the pheromones are great. The Adaptil is very good. You can use a spray there's a diffuser you can use an adaptive collar um, thunder shirts work well and they're good anti-anxiety tools if the dog won't chew it off so that would also depend on how likely the dog is to kind of go after stuff that they may have on um, another thing that's really helpful is classical music or reggae music those are the two types that dogs respond the best to so make sure you have some noise and some stuff playing um, so that they are not hearing all the outside sounds if it's an issue just with you leaving, so say they get very anxious upon you leaving, but they settle down after, what I would do is just start desensitizing them to that environment. So if they, if you have a certain routine, like you grab your keys and you grab your purse and you head out, then I would do that and then immediately come back in or grab your purse and keys, leave for five minutes, come back in, that sort of thing. So if they see all of these things transpiring, it's not such a huge event that causes anxiety for them. But yep, those are the main tips. Also, if your dog will enjoy a snack when you're not home, a Kong frozen with peanut butter is a really good way to keep them busy. So if that initial maybe hour period is really difficult for them, you can put some peanut butter in a Kong, freeze it, and if they will, you know, if they'll get into the Kong, then that'll keep them busy probably for 30 to 45 minutes. And a lot of dogs will settle down after that period of time with the absence. So where do you get the hormone spray? You can get it at Amazon. You can get it at your local pet stores. I think everyone has it. Um, the It's called Adaptil. That's the brand that I use the most. Um, there are other brands of it, though, but that's kind of the starting point with Adaptil. So any other questions if we have any okay going once oh here we go <laughs> um, yeah they do mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lots of stuff you can find on YouTube that's good, that are good resources for calming your dog. I actually have a CD um, that I play during classes called Through a Dog's Ear. So it's a series of music that has been scientifically proven to relax dogs. And I do that in classes as well. So that's a good, good thing to kind of stream so your dog has, you know, some soothing sounds. They make it for cats also. Um, that's a good one as well. And I actually use the Through a Dog's Ear. It's, you know, July fourth is coming up and a lot of a lot of dogs have issues with fireworks and it's a very scary time for them so all these things that i'm mentioning that you can use for separation anxiety can also be used for anxiety of any kind as far as if that if that's a problem for them with the noise the pheromones work great the thunder shirt having kind of the white noise on and the the music playing in the background is really important as well
Okay, I believe we're coming to the end of the day session and uh, just have a few things I want to remind you uh, of. Um, to join the next session is next Thursday at noon. Um, our topic and the registration link will appear in your chat. So do we have the um, information about next week's session coming up shortly. Um, the session will be on July the 1st. It's aging in place with pets. And again, you'll need to register for that in order to participate. Um, and please complete the survey and provide us feedback on today's session. If you register through AERP, we will email you the link shortly after the session so you can fill that out. If you just happened upon us on Facebook, um, you won't be registered, you won't get that email, but um, you'll see a link in the comments section that you can go to and just give us comments on how today went. Um, all right, and now I would like to introduce our partner from Appalachian State University, Emily, who's going to explain her work and a study that they're working together on um, about animals and, and pet relations. Hey, hey, everybody. Um, and this is this is my sleeping son, Perry, who's home from camp today because there's a cold going around and he just fell asleep during the talk. So um, uh, it's great to be here today. And um, I am uh, a partner with my colleagues, Dr. Maureen McNamara and uh, Dr. Kelly Williams in an upcoming study, and I'm gonna read you some information about it. Um, so in most US communities, about a third of adults over the age of 65 share their lives with a pet. Pets play important roles in the lives of older adults, such as helping humans' needs for belonging and meaning. Yet little is known about the role that pets play in healthy aging in rural communities. So the aim of the project that we're working on is to develop and pilot test a survey about pets and people in rural communities. We want to hear from people who have pets and also from people who don't have pets. In addition, we would love to hear from people who may have pets that many think of as farm animals or livestock. In the comment section, I will post a link to an interest form so that we can send you a survey in late September or, or early October. Um, thank you in advance for your interest in this project. And let me um, also just clarify that this study is not part of uh, AARP. Um, it's, so the site that I am taking you to is uh, an interest form um, and it's not an ASU or an AARP landing page. So I'm going to post in the comments a link to the interest forum. Let's see, how do I post a comment? Um, I'm going to post the link in the private chat and hope that maybe the host could share that link in the comments. Okay, I think I think it's been added. Um, so we'll, we'll move on. Um, we are now at the end of today's session and I would like to thank Melissa and Emily for being here as well as thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you haven't already, please register for and join us for the July 1st Aging in Place with Pets. Um, also, please remember to fill out the survey and tell us uh, what you liked and what we need to change. Um, again, there's one more session next week, so hope you hope you come back. Thanks for, thanks for today.